Opportunity be with, to be with you this evening. So I'm very happy to see the deities here. Lord Jagannath, kindly come here to bless the house. Very fortunate. Lord Jagannath. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Lord Jagannath, along with his brother. Balarama and his sister Subhadra, a family, you see. So we have some families here, I see some children are here. And they were also, little Gira was clapping her hands, taking part in the kirtan. So very nice. Krishna consciousness is for everyone. Whatever age, whatever position in society we belong, they can take part in these activities and be greatly benefited. What is the benefit? Well, the benefit is, first of all, we'll come to know more about our own self. That's very important, to understand our own identity who we are. So you could say this Krishna consciousness is a process of self-realization. That's a more technical way of describing the identity crisis. You know. People need to understand 
their identity. And when we can actually come to the proper understanding of identity, then all the problems can be solved. They can all disappear just simply by knowing something about a real self. So from the Bhagavad Gita, which is like our handbook or our guidebook in understanding spiritual knowledge and wisdom of life, the Bhagavad Gita guides us. Do you all have a Bhagavad Gita? Everyone's got a book. Yes, good. So Bhagavad Gita, we're distributing it. Today, we were in one lady's house and she told me, she put, she saw there was a, something on Facebook. It was uh, ladies in Dubai, something like that. Ladies in Dubai. So she put an, a comment on there saying that I have Bhagavad Gita is in more than 10 different languages. If anyone's interested, please contact me and I'm having regular classes on the Bhagavad Gita. And she, she thought, I'll just try it and see. She didn't expect to get any response, but she was surprised. She got over a hundred responses. <laughs> so that was just from Dubai. And even people in the same building where she was living, <laughs> they didn't know where she was residing, but some people, she found out later that some of the people who responded were living in the same building where she was living. So the point is people are looking for this kind of knowledge, this kind of information. They want to understand more about the nature of the self, who we are, why we're here, where we're going. When I was a, a student myself, I used to ask these kind of questions and I could never get any proper answers. People would generally say, oh, you'll find out later in life, you know, just be patient, later everything will be. So nobody could really answer, people were just like putting me off, you know. But then I happened to get one of Prabhupada's books and I read one of his small books and I got so much information, I was deeply impressed. And it brought me to go to visit our centre in London and I was happy to discuss spiritual knowledge with the devotees who were living there. And I was Im deeply impressed in their conviction. And I decided I also wanted to develop that same wisdom and knowledge and faith which they had. And so I took part in Krishna consciousness in this movement. And I have been for many years now, and I've been trying to introduce it also in other countries, particularly in the Far East, in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and I also go to China and Russia. So we try to introduce Krishna consciousness everywhere. Because this consciousness is in everyone, but it needs to be awakened. And the manner in which it's awakened is through hearing. You have to give oral reception to the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. We have to hear the message of Lord Krishna. Understanding, first of all, who I am, that we are not the body, we are living in the body and we have to understand with deep conviction that we are souls. <coughs> the soul is not material. As I said, that sometimes I go to Buddhist countries like Taiwan, so there's a Buddhist, ma there was one Buddhist master there. And he was a very well-known 
master, he had many followers. And he used to also talk about the soul. But his understanding of the soul was that the soul is temporary, just like the body is temporary. He was talking about the soul, that it is temporary, that it exists for some time, but ultimately it becomes nothing. Because that's the Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist teachings, they simply talk about nothing, <laughs> right? They talk about what, what you would call the void. In other words, nothingness. And their idea, their teaching is that you don't exist. Nothing is real. The world is not real. Do any of you share that belief? Do you believe that? The world is not real? And you are not real? And nothing is real? No. It's ridiculous, isn't it, to think like that. The world is very real. If you say the world is not real, then your daughter is not real, right? That child which you're holding in your arms, she's not real, she doesn't really exist. You know, how could you ever think like that? It's just beyond belief. But this is, this is the idea, the concept of Buddhism. They talk like this. And there are other people, they talk about the oneness, that everything is one. The oneness. And that's quite common in India also. You've got many teachers, many so-called spiritual people presenting the idea that everything is one. So if everything is one, then I am you and you are me, and we are all one, right? There's no difference, man and woman, young people, old people, women, children, it's all, we're all one. Well, <coughs> there's some truth in it. It has to be qualified. We have to understand where is the oneness. The oneness is in the sense that we're all souls. And we have a material body. So that's one thing which we have. We're, we're one, but at the same time, we're different. We cannot say that I am you and you are me. I don't know about your pain and pleasures and neither do you know about my pain and pleasure because we're individuals. We're all individuals. Although there's a oneness in the sense that we have something in common, there are also differences. And we have, we each have our own individual identity. And this is probably the first point which Lord Krishna brings out in the Bhagavad Gita. He begins, because Lord Krishna has to convince Arjuna in order to, he, he wants to convince Arjuna that he should take part in this great battle at Kurukshetra. So Lord Krishna, oh, but, uh, Arjuna surrenders to Lord Krishna and Arjuna requests Lord Krishna to help him. Arjuna said, I'm confused. So that, that, that was an uh, honest submission on the part of Arjuna. He approached Lord Krishna, how can I be your teacher? You and I are friends. <laughs> but then Lord Krishna continued and he went on and he immediately took the position of the teacher because he understood Arjuna's sincerity, that he wanted to know, he wanted to hear from Lord Krishna. That's very important. 
our sincerity of purpose. We have to be with Arjuna has come to Krishna expressed his condition that he didn't know and he wants to hear from Krishna. So Lord Krishna begins to instruct him and he talk, tells him first of all, never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you and nor all these kings, nor in the future will any of us ever cease to be. So Lord Krishna gave this statement which is all-inclusive. I, meaning the first person, <laughs> you, second person, and all the kings, third person. Do you remember English grammar? First person, second person, third person, right? I, you, and they. So he said, everyone, we are all eternal. We are all eternal beings. So in what sense are we eternal? We exist, we continue to exist, but we know this body does not continue to exist. This body is just simply the vehicle for us. Just like here in Dubai, so many vehicles, right? Somebody's got the big car, someone's got the small car, someone's got the little scooter, someone's on the bicycle, many vehicles. The body is also a vehicle. And the Vedas tell us that there are 8,400,000 different vehicles, different types of vehicles. Different types of vehicles, just like we see. BMW, Mercedes-Benz, you know, this, that kind of car. And so there are different species of life. There are human species, there are animal species, there are plant species, there are the, the, the mammals, there are the aquatics who live in the sea. There's so many different species, 8,400,000, and it said only 400,000 are human species. We can see among the human species, there's, uh, you have like, Caucasian, you know, I'm ca Caucasian, European stock. And then you've got the, you've got like African, you've got es Eskimos, people living in the wasteland. You've got Asian people, the Chinese people, you know, they're all different. They have their different characteristics, different bodies. And there are human species also in other places, not only on this planet. There are other places also. So the human body in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes it to be just like the dress. And just as we change the dress, we change the body. We see the little girl here in the child's body, but in years to come, her body will grow and she'll develop into a young woman. And as time goes on, one day, she will eventually become middle-aged and then become an elderly woman. The body changes. The body is just the vehicle. Just like we live in apartments. Our apartment is here today. In course of time it becomes old. And maybe in future they'll have to renovate it or even knock it down and rebuild whatever. So the material body is like that. It is matter. It is material. We identify with the body. 
we spend a lot of time to take care of the body. Of course, we, we can't neglect the body. We have to live in it, just like you have an apartment. You take care of your apartment, you maintain it. So in the same way, we have to maintain the body. But the body is not the only thing which needs to be taken care of. There is also the subtle body. We have, all, we have a gross physical body, but there is also a subtle body. Subtle body means the mind, and the intelligence, and the ego. These things make, these are the elements of the subtle body. Lord Krishna describes this in the Bhagavad Gita that there are eight elements in the material world. You have the five gross elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, right? The five Mahabhutis, the elements of the material nature. And then you have the three subtle elements, the mind, the intelligence, and ego. And Lord Krishna describes this is his separated material energy. Separated from him, Lord Krishna, it's Lord Krishna's energy, but he is not very, he's not very attached to the material energy because he has his own existence in another place, separate from this place. This is the material world, the material creation. We are here with our material bodies. But we are not the material body. We are only living in the body. We are making use of the body. We live in the apartment. We don't become the apartment. We simply live here. And so we live in the body. We are all spiritual beings. We have to take care of the physical body, physical body, maybe you do things like go for a walk regularly, go to the gym, maybe even go swimming, or maybe be, be careful what you eat, don't eat too much, don't eat too little, different things to keep the body healthy. Then you have to take care of the mind. How do you take care of the mind? You want to re relax the mind. You want to feel peaceful and relax. So how will you do it? Some people may even do meditation. They may just want to meditate. They may feel calm by doing some kind of meditation. Other people, for the, for the mind, they may enjoy painting or Poetry, maybe they write poetry or read poetry or read some novel. Of course, more common people, they will watch movies. That's very common, isn't it, today? You know, we feel we can pass a lot of time watching movies and forget about the realities of life. Sit in front of a screen and watch some movie, different things we do for the mind. So take care of them. The, it's important to take care of the mind. A lot of health problems come because the mind is not properly controlled. The mind is not peaceful. If you're greatly agitated and stressed, then it will certainly affect your health, physical health will be affected by the subtle body. So it's important to keep the mind calm and relaxed. But even more important than the mind is the soul. The soul is the spiritual body, the spiritual part. Actually, the soul is our real self, our real identity. As a person, we're all souls, and we have to take care of the soul. Spiritual knowledge, 
is good for the soul. In other words, read the Bhagavad Gita, go to temple and hear the kata, listen to bhajans sung by the devotees and even take part sometimes in kirtan as we were doing this evening. This is all spiritual recreation for the soul, for the benefit of the soul. And if we keep the soul healthy, the mind will also be healthy. When the mind is healthy, the body will also be taken care of. So it works like that. We have to understand the, the higher principle, the spiritual principle, taking care of the self, meaning the soul, by spiritual activities. Just as there are material activities, which are for the body, for the pleasure of the body, there are spiritual activities, which are for the benefit of the soul. Spiritual activities are learned <coughs> under the guidance of devotees, under the guidance of spiritual teachers and so on. They will teach us. They will encourage us and they will guide us in our practice of spiritual activities. So Krishna consciousness, what we're doing is actually, it's a process, it's a science by which we can come to know ourself. And as we go on, knowing ourself is just simply the beginning of spiritual knowledge. We want to go on and understand who is higher than the self, that there is a supreme being behind this world. Sometimes we will ask people, how many of you believe in God? You know, and in some countries people are trained in the atheism, to be atheists. If you're brought up in, for example, in a country like China, they teach atheism. You go to college, you go to school even, they will teach you Marxism, the teachings of Karl Marx. He is the founder of the socialist, the communist teaching, and he taught Religion is the opium of the people. <laughs> In other words, he said it's not a good thing, it's a bad thing. So, because of that teaching, you know, they reject all religions and they don't believe in God. There are cultures like that, they have no belief in God. But there are other countries where people are very religious. They do believe in God. They understand there is a supreme being. There's a, there must be some creator behind this world. We can see in the world there, there is creation. There are so many signs of creation. Just like Dubai, it's a city. Who created it? You know, there are intelligent men who design everything. They arrange for water supply, although it's in the desert, still you're able to get water, you're able to get electricity, you're able to get medical facilities, and so on. There has to be intelligent people organizing these things. So, if we say nobody created it, it's just all there. It, it's not true, it's just not, not possible. But even today, people talk about creation, how did the world come about? Oh, the Big Bang, there was an explosion, and suddenly it was all there. Where did it come from? Oh, from the Big Bang, from the Expo, it just came by chance, right? Just by chance. 
Is it possible? It's not possible. It's not feasible. But even sometimes so-called intelligent and so-called scholarly people talk about these things. They talk in that way. So the teach even the, there's a teaching of Maya Vada or the impersonalism. I was speaking about how some people talk about everything as being one. They talk about the oneness of everything. And they consider the goal of life to become one with everything in the world, enter into the oneness. But then how, where does the world come from? That they don't explain. Or they, will, they will present some materialistic idea that there was a big bang. Or another theory is Darwin's theory, the theory of evolution, that we have evolved from the apes, right? You must have all heard of Darwin and his theory that we evolved from the lower forms of life. Now we have the human body, but previously, going back thousands of years, we were apes or whatever, lower forms of life, you see. And before that, we were maybe aquatics, you know, amphibian live in the sea, come on the land, and before that everyone was in the sea, living in the water. So they explain that life has evolved, and the human form of life has evolved. It just evolves, just by <coughs> chance, just in the course of time. But we don't see that happening anywhere, because today all different forms of life are present. And we don't see any lower forms of life changing into higher forms of life. So we don't accept that there's an evolution of life. But rather, we propose that everyone has, human form of life has been in existence since the beginning of time, since the beginning of the creation. And creation, when we talk about creation, means there was a creator. There was a person who was given the job. Now, usually we would speak about Lord Brahma like that, that we consider him to be the creator. Where does Lord Brahma come from? Lord Brahma comes from the lotus flower. We see Lord Brahma, Chaturmuk Brahma, is sitting on a lotus, a lotus flower. Where did that lotus flower come from? It came from the navel of Lord Vishnu. Who is Lord Vishnu? Lord Vishnu is the Lord of the creation. That person from which the creation comes about. So Lord Vishnu is before the creation. He is existing. We also existed before the creation, but we didn't have a body at that time. The secondary <coughs> part of creation is done by Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma takes over from Lord Vishnu. So there's a trinity. You no, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma is considered creator. Vishnu is doing the work of maintaining. He makes sure everything goes on. What's more difficult, creating or maintaining? maintaining. Yes, right. Isn't it more difficult? It's not so difficult to begin something, but it's difficult to maintain it. Therefore, Lord Vishnu takes on the work of maintaining everything. And then when it comes time for destruction, Lord Shiva is called. That's his job. 
Of course, Lord Shiva is also active in other ways, but principally his main duty is at the time of destruction. The, the, the material world has a beginning and it also has an end. There's a, it's the nature of matter, the material world. All of the buildings and all of the cars and everything, they're not eternal. They don't last forever. For some time they're existing and then in course of time they're finished. So the same is true with the material world. Everything in the material world has a beginning and an end. We have to understand how to use everything carefully. We understand that this world is not ours. It doesn't belong to us. We come, of course, we come into this world and we like to have our own, you know, like to have our house, maybe like to even have some land and so on. But it was there before us. Before we were born, the land was there. And after we leave the world, the land will be there also. So people fighting, just like there's a lot of wars going on even today, you know, you've got so many conflicts, Russia and Ukraine, and then you've got the Israelis and the Arabs, and then you've got, oh, wherever you look in the world, you can find there'll be some conflicts. The nature, material world. This age is called the Kali Yuga, and the nature of this Kali Yuga, age of quarrel, arguing everywhere, quarreling, and it's going on even at the international level, between nations, arguments are going on. What to speak of in the home, all the time, arguing, quarreling, it goes on. So, this is symptom of the age, this age, Kali Yuga. And we have to overcome the influence of this age. How to overcome the influence of this age? We have to come over the material platform and bring ourselves to the spiritual platform, to the platform of transcendence, to understand, as I said in the beginning, first of all, that we're not the body. That is the beginning of transcendence. Then we have to go on and understand who is the creator? Where does this world come from? So that is more difficult. It takes some education. We have to hear. And we, the best place to hear from is from scriptures. Books like Bhagavad Gita and the Vedas, we read particularly the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, the whole Bhagavad Gita is giving us the Vedic knowledge in a, in a simple manner, in the manner in which everyone can understand. Bhagavad Gita is like the ABC of spiritual knowledge. And it can greatly benefit us. It can help us to open our eyes to see the world in a different way from how we usually think of life. Usually we're thinking the world is here for my enjoyment, for my pleasure. But from the Bhagavad Gita we learn something else. We learn there's a higher purpose to life not just only for our own self, but for the pleasure of Lord Jagannath. Lord Jagannath sitting there and he is waiting for us to come to him, to take the shelter. There's a beautiful song, maybe you know Jagannath Astikam. I say, Jagannatha Swami Nayana Patagani Bhava to me. 
O Lord of the universe, Lord Jagannath, kindly be visible unto me. So we have to see Lord Jagannath not just with our material eyes. We have to see him with the eye of knowledge. You have to see him through the eye of scriptures. Then we can properly understand him. So hearing from books like Ramayana, Mahabharata, these things help us. But to get the real knowledge, you have to come to Bhagavad Gita. And then you can go on from the Bhagavad Gita to read Srimad Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam is like the cream of the Vedas. The Vedic knowledge is like a tree. And trees are nice, but they're more valuable when they have some fruit. If you have a mango tree, then when there's no mangoes, you don't worry too much about the tree. But as soon as there are mangoes on the tree, then you take care. You want to protect and harvest the mangoes when they're ready. So the Vedas are like a tree. And the fruit of that tree of the Vedas, that is Srimad Bhagavatam. It is described like that. So we encourage people to read also, to hear the message of the Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam. Some often they have Bhagavad Sapta or Bhagavad Katha. It's important for us to hear this kind of wisdom because it brings us to the platform of knowledge, to actually see things in their reality. Just looking the eyes, our eyes only see externally. We don't see the spiritual. We don't even see the subtle form. We just see the external. So it's important to see more, to look deeper, more closely. And to do that, we have to have the guidance of Shastra, scriptures. And the best scripture, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. You can easily get these books. They're available hard and soft copies. And you can read them and you want to hear regularly. We need to hear because we are conditioned souls. We are all conditioned to the material world and we are thinking about ourselves as a body. We identify, we think, I'm a man or I'm a woman, I'm an Indian or I'm a British, I'm young or I'm old. We're thinking in relation to the body. We have to think higher and understand that I am living in the body, but I'm a spirit soul. And my spirit soul is eternally a part of the Supreme. I have a relationship with the Supreme. And by practicing Bhakti Yoga, we can understand that relationship. So the science of Bhakti, devotion, is considered the Supreme Science of Yoga. And this is described in books like Bhagavad Gita and it's recommended by all the great acharyas and masters that bhakti is the ultimate path to transcendence. Lord Krishna himself states in the Bhagavad Gita that there's nothing higher than the path of devotion. Actually, the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna is describing a ladder, a yoga ladder. And there's a progression, just like you climb up the ladder. So there's a yoga ladder and it begins with karma yoga, working for Krishna. 
working for Krishna. You don't know what, you don't know what you're doing, you're just working. Working, but working in a detached manner. And then you go on coming to, you get, you get some knowledge, you get some teaching, you're, you come to Gyan Yoga. And from Gyan Yoga, then we go on meditation, Dhyana Yoga. We start, because when we get Gyan, we learn that there's a soul in the heart. And we, we will want to meditate on that soul. And so we will meditate on, come to Dhyana Yoga. And then when we're meditating, we will understand that I am the servant of that Supreme Soul. And we will want to take up activities of devotion, Bhakti Yoga. So this is the progression as it's described in the Shastra, to come to Bhakti. And we see in the Bhagavad Gita how Arjuna is talking and he, he comes to understand Krishna as the Supreme Person. And he wants to recognize Krishna as the Supreme. Lord Krishna had spoken to him, had been guiding him, instructing him. And Arjuna became convinced of Krishna's divine position. But he said, Arjuna said, not only do I accept you, but he said, even great sages, <coughs> and he mentions ne Asita, Devala, Vyasa, Narada, they also accept you. So Arjuna was saying that I, I'm only one person, but I'm not the only one who accepts Krishna. So many other great sages and philosophers and saints, they also accept Krishna as the Supreme. So in this way, Arjuna was describing his position and how he's surrendering to Krishna. And he became, he becomes convinced, hearing from Krishna that, yes, he's now, now I've heard everything, now I'm convinced, I'm ready to do what you tell me. And Lord Krishna, he said, are you sure, are you ready? If Lord Krishna said, I'm ready to tell you Bhagavad Gita again, if you're not convinced. I'll tell you it all again. I said, no, it's okay, I'm convinced. I've heard it and I, I accept and I'm ready to do as you want. So this is Bhagavad Gita, which is guiding us in the path of self-realization. Once we know our own self, then it's described at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, spoken by Sanjaya. Sanjaya is speaking to Dhritarashtra, Dhritarashtra wants to know what's happening at Kurukshetra. So Sanjay tells him that wherever there is Krishna, with this um, statement, this judgment given by Sanjay, that these things will be there. And certainly these four things are something we would all like to have in every endeavor victory, morality, extraordinary power, and opulence. Hmm. It's important for us to hear this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita. It can make our life sublime. And we can become happy in our life just simply by hearing the Bhagavad Gita. Are there any questions? <coughs> yes, Prabhu. Thank you, Mother. Very in short time you explained Bhagavad Gita, the essence of true Bhagavad Gita, Maharaj. Maharaj, I have to understand, we hear about soul and we, we have heard that we have spiritual bodies also. So, when the soul is one tenth part of, ten thousand part of our head, so how our spiritual, like we have heard that our spiritual body is covered by this material body. So how to understand the connection, like when we leave this body, so, so, so size we hear is very small, so how to understand this body is 
they are both different or they are it, it is one that is what the confusion is well my understanding is that the spirit soul when it leaves the material body and enters into the spiritual world at that time the spirit soul will manifest the spiritual body that is contained within the that one ten thousandth of the tip of the hair and it manifests the spiritual form from that particle hmm. When we go to the spiritual world, we can have a spiritual body. Material body subject to age and disease and death. But the spiritual body is eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. And by nature we're all spiritual beings, but we're living in the material body. So when we go back to the spiritual world when we enter into the spiritual world that time we will manifest our spiritual body and we are all spiritual beings but we have taken these temporary bodies there is one more doubt that we hear about we have 400,000 human forms so how to understand that, <coughs> how it is basically to understand, as we see uh, humans as one form, so how 400,000, what exactly it means? Well, just like on the planet, we see different races among the human species. There's different races, you know, the Chinese, they have their nature, and the, the Westerners, the Caucasians, the Africans, you know, they're all different species. Even in India, they have tribal races, you know, the Aboriginal people and so on. So we see there are many different varieties among the human species. Some are very big, some people are very big, some are very small, and some have very fair skin, some have very dark different races, different varieties. So in this way we understand four like human species. Yes, any other questions? Maharaj, uh, you spoke about <clears throat> when you preached uh, in the Far East, you came across uh, Buddhist and sometimes in some places Mayavad philosophy. And when we hear this type of philosophy, we've got to be coming to Krishna conversation, reading from Sri Prabhupada's books and so on. We find the that philosophy of Mayavad and the uh, philosophy of the Buddhism is uh, very, very uh, illogical. It doesn't make sense. But how is it that they still find sense in that? How do they find logic in that? Well, how, how, do, yeah, we, we do see that more people take to impersonal philosophy than to personal philosophy. More people are inclined to the impersonal path. It's easier for them to understand. It's more difficult to understand the personal aspect of God. But it's easier for people to think of God as being impersonal, as just being some energy. We think of our own self as being God. <laughs> we have that mentality, you know, that among conditioned life, we think of our own self as being supreme. Of course, it's a demoniac nature, but that it's there in all of us that we can have that tendency to think, I am the controller, I am the enjoyer, this is mine. We have that mentality, we think of ourselves as being the supreme. I can do what I like. Who should tell, nobody should tell me what to do. Impersonalism, we're thinking of our own, we're thinking there's no one over me. There's nobody who I have to submit to. 
there was one famous Englishman, an author, uh, and he, he wrote a book, Confessions of an Atheist. He said, if I have to accept God, then I'm obliged to follow so many rules and principles. But if I myself am God, or if there's no God, actually if, if you say everyone's God, there's no meaning to God anymore, then you can do whatever you like. Right? Nobody nobody's can tell you, though you can't do this, or this is wrong, or you shouldn't do that. And you can do whatever you like, because you're God. Right? So that mentality is very common. People want to be, they think it's freedom. And people even say, I'm free, I can do what I like. You, you have to be a vegetarian, oh, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. I can eat everything. They're thinking like that, right? They'll say, I can eat everything. Are you free? They're not free. They're controlled by the material nature. The modes, the Raja Gun, the Tamagun are controlling them. But they're thinking they're free. It's the illusion. So people have that illusion. They think they're free. They think they can do what they like. And so they think they're God. How, is, how could we preach to them, basically presenting the philosophy that we heard? Well, philosophy is a difficult thing to get through to them. Rather, our preaching is more with the holy name and prasada. Just simply by having very nice prasada and the chanting of the holy name, they'll become purified. If they eat prasada and they chant the maha mantra with devotees, they can become purified and gradually they can accept. And Prabhupada was doing like that. Prabhupada used to do like that. Uh, there was the example, there was what, this big scientist, he came to meet Prabhupada and, uh, and Prabhupada was preaching to him for some time. And so the man was listening, sometimes he would argue, sometimes he would listen, you know, wasn't too much impressed. But what happened while Prabhupada was talking to him, a devotee brought in a big plate of Maha Prasadam and gave it to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada took the plate and said, this is for you. <laughs> and, and you know, the man looked and, and it was very nice, it was all very sumptuous prasadam, you know, eggplant parmesan and all these different things, you know. And the man started to eat different things, you know. And he was eating and he was really enjoying it. And Prabhupada kept preaching. And as Prabhupada was preaching, he started to support everything Prabhupada said. <laughs> and started to give arguments to support Prabhupada also. So Prabhupada was like showing us, and this is how you preach to these people. You know, prasadam is really very important weapon in presenting Krishna consciousness. Prasadam and kirtan, very powerful in the Kali Yuga. The holy name, the chanting of the holy name, it can change people. Their spiritual nature can be awakened. In the Brihad Bhagavatamrita, Sanatana Goswami describes how uh, there was a Sankirtan party coming out of Vaikuntha and they were coming out of Vaikuntha and they came into the region of the Brahmajoiti and in the region of the Brahmajoiti they met people and sometimes people become attracted to the Kirtan. They bring them out from the Brahmajoiti, they meet the Sankirtan party, they join the Sankirtan and go with the Sankirtan party. So, the Sankirtan party is very important, very powerful. Can save the impersonalists from the 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 dull oneness of the Brahman. But just giving philosophy, you can argue endlessly. So, Lord Chaitanya 
like to give more the holy name. Lord Chaitanya didn't discuss philosophy very much. He was giving more the holy name, only with a few special souls that he discussed philosophy. Even when he met Prakashananda Sarasati and Banaras, he didn't get into the philosophy too much. He just spoke really about the chanting of the holy name and the essence of the Vedas is in the chanting of the holy name. And he was so powerful that when he, everything he said, they accepted. And then he, he chanted Hare, and they all chanted Hare Krishna. And after they chanted Hare Krishna, then Lord Chaitanya took prasadam with them. Lord Chaitanya usually, he would never take prasad with the Mayavadi sannyasis. But now they chanted Hare Krishna. He thought, now they've chanted the holy name, now they're devotees. And he took prasad with them. So this, we got, we've got to get people to chant Hare Krishna. Even they chant jokingly, mocking that it's the beginning of their spiritual life. Are you all chanting? Hmm? Good. I hope you chanting this. It's very important for us. Okay, Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada. Ki Jai. His Holiness, Bhakti, Vishnash, 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 any more questions? Just one more question. Yeah. How, uh, when Chama Krishna Maharaj went to China, he can't do kirtan on the streets. So how did he manage to preach over there? Well, we did some things like uh, we'd go in the park and meet people and sometimes we would chant in the park. And we smuggled books in and we distributed freely to everyone. We'd give them books and then we'd ask them, what do you think? Did you read the book? Are you interested? And just from that, find out. And these books were in English or Chinese? Chinese. Chinese. Yeah. Sometimes people would ask English, mostly, nearly always Chinese. Chinese educated, they want Chinese books. So we have all the books translated to Chinese. So you have to do all this secretly? Huh? You have to do it secretly? Oh yeah. Uh, so not like this? Okay. Well, and it's, sometimes we did, but you know, it's just too, it's too much, you know. They, I mean, you, you're exposed. <coughs> you have to try to be discreet, try to be undercover. If you wear these clothes, it's sensational. It attracts so many people. Did you get in trouble at any time? Oh yeah. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> it goes all the time. Maharaj Govindanand Prabhu's appearance at the party. Oh. Hi, who are you? Is your daughter? Yes, she, her birthday is tomorrow morning. Oh, tomorrow. <laughs> 